one in class. Hope everybody's doing fine. We are looking at 1.5 inverse functions and logs. Um, we have uh, covered uh, four ways of representing a function, mathematical models, new functions from old, exponential functions, and now we're gonna move on to the new section, inverse functions and logs. Uh, we recall from 1.3 as far as the algebra of functions, composite functions, and old functions from the new functions, in other words, transformations, how they look like. Uh, some uh, formulas for exponents, exponential rules were discussed, and then the exponential function. And the main thing to remember, the base is either larger than one or between zero and one, because if it's equal to one, it is not an exponential function. So we're gonna to go to the new stuff now, okay. And so let's uh, get started by putting it in the slideshow. All right, um, we are going to look at some uh, definitions we have seen. There is not much brand new, everything is posted. So I wanna go over this pretty fast. This is the synopsis of inverse functions. Um, first, a function uh, can, be, can have an inverse if it's one-to-one. -one. So what is the definition of a one-to-one -one function? I remind you uh, of uh, the definition of a function. In short, X couldn't repeat it would become a function. Now the y cannot repeat either. So a one-to-one -one function is that if the y's are different, so are x's. That's the idea. And we had a vertical line test to test whether a graph represents a function. Now we have a horizontal line test. The function is one-to-one. -one. If and only if no horizontal line intersects the graph more than once, okay? So that is something we have seen. Now, by definition, when we write the inverse function, their domain and their range interchange, okay? So when we say f inverse of y equals x, it's the same as saying f of x equals y. Um, their composite function is equal to x, okay? x and y, with the f function, we map x into y, and with, with f inverse, we reverse the process, okay? So if f maps x into y, then f inverse does the reverse process, maps y back into x, okay, class? That's um, the synopsis of that. Now, if we look at it from a, a function machine point of view, take a look at what happens. When you enter the x into the f of x machine and then into f inverse, they undo each other and we get x. And this has a lot of applications, for example, encryption. So if you happen to put a number in here, class, instead of x, okay? That is, let's say, the first digit of your credit card number, then the, when they claim it's a, a secure environment, then f of x immediately changes it and nobody can see what's the original number in between. Maybe somebody grabs it, but it doesn't matter. At the end, when it goes back to the company with the F inverse, they change it. And again, they get the same digit back. Now, if two functions are inverse of each other, their composite function is X, okay? So this is the synopsis of the section as far as inverse functions uh, is concerned. And these definitions are repeating again, and this uh, uh, horizontal line test that was discussed is really nothing brand new. We are repeating the previous page in essence. So is this function a one-to-one? -one? In order to see whether a function is one-to-one -one or not, uh, one is of course you can graph it and you look at the graph and horizontal uh, line test, okay? The other one is that if x1 and x2 are different, the result must be different. There is, you know, uh, no way to come up with um, two numbers that have the same cube. And in order to prove otherwise, all you have to do is come up with one pair. For example, 
Well, if f of x equals x squared, you can easily see that's not the case because uh, if it's positive and negative value of the same number, f of x becomes the same. So um, that's how you uh, unprove something. Of course, the graph and a horizontal line test will uh, do that for us. So that's very straightforward. Um, the next thing I want to look at, again, we're going to repeat this stuff that we have seen in the summary, okay? Two functions are inverse of each other. Look at the uh, function machines, one after another, and what happens. Look at the composite function that was discussed. A very simple example, we just looked at x cubed. So what is its inverse? Okay, it's x to the power of one third or cube root of x. And we will go through the process of finding that. We'll see how it is found. But in the meantime, if that is the case, and somebody says, okay, these are the two functions. Are they inverse? And you claim they are inverse function. You have to prove by looking at their composite function. So if you look at, and you don't have to do both, but it's a good practice to do both. So if you find f inverse of or f of inverse, either one makes no difference, should give you an x. Now, how do you find the inverse function? There are really a, a couple of methods. Uh, ultimately, they become the same. One of them is you change the f of x to y, okay? You solve this equation for x in terms of y, and then uh, you change the y into f inverse. What do we mean by that? So I'm going to quickly show you a simple example. I want to do it two ways because I don't know which way you've been exposed to. You can stick with the method that you are comfortable with, okay? So uh, we have the function uh, y equals x cubed plus two, okay? We want to find the inverse, okay? So we solve for x. What does it mean? Move the number two and take a cube. So we are moving the number two. If whether you write y minus two equals x cubed or x cubed equals y minus two makes no difference class. And so x becomes the cube root of y minus two. Okay, now you do the interchange. What do you do? You interchange x and y. So x becomes y, y becomes x. You're done, just change the name from y to f inverse. And this is absolutely fine. The way I like to do it, and again, it's, it's, it's similar class, you stick with the method if you're doing the homework or exam and they want you to do it in a specific order, you follow that, but I want you to be exposed to both of them. The way I do it, it's very simple. I start with the given and change the f of x to y. That's the first step, that's the same thing. So I do the interchanging here. In other words, right here, I change the y to x and x to y. So this is what I get. Okay. Now I solve for y. So I'm going to move the two. That means I'm going to subtract two. And then I take a cube root. And I'm done. I just change the name y into f inverse. And that's it. Okay, class. Now, you really have to check your work. Uh, I haven't done it yet, so I'm going to quickly go over this for you here, okay? But uh, I leave that normally to you. You should be able to do one of those, okay? So if we stick with one of them, let's say we are going to do f o f inverse, which means f of f inverse of x. That means x cubed plus two. Now I'm gonna use a different color. 
I'm going to replace this with F inverse, which is cube root of X minus two. So what happens, it comes out as X minus two. We have the plus two outside and the final answer is X. And that's a proof we haven't made a mistake class. I hope it is clear to you. All right, f of one is given, f of three is given, f of eight is given, and we want to find their inverse. So it's very important to understand, just for the sake of argument, if you're looking at this case, if f of one is five, that means f inverse of five is one. That's really the meaning of it. f of one is five. I, I want to just concentrate on that and I'll tell you what that means. It means one comma five is a pair that belongs, this is an element of, okay, f of x. That's the meaning of f of one equals five. So if we have a pair one comma five, Okay, everybody. Therefore, we have a comma, we have a pair five comma one. You can find this on the graph of which function? F inverse. That's the meaning of it. As long as I know this meaning, practically I'm done. Okay. F inverse of five is one because f of one is five, f inverse of seven is three, okay? And f inverse of negative 10 is eight because f of it is negative 10. And if this is f, f inverse maps it back. It's very simple, okay? So take a look at what I wrote at the top and make sure you're very comfortable with what I have at the top. Then the rest becomes easy, okay? So the moment you see f of one equals five, the meaning is the pair one comma five. Okay, class. And for inverse means the pair five comma five. That's obvious. Okay, very straightforward. All right, let's find the inverse function here. This is a little bit more interesting. So what we do, uh, we start by going through the process. The process that uh, I like is immediately I change the name f of x to one, okay? And then I will interchange x and y. So wherever I see x, I change it to y. Wherever I see y, I change it to x. And believe it or not, at this step, we pretty much have the inverse. This is it, this is the inverse. However, we write as, a, uh, as y equals y as a function of x. That's why we solve for y. To solve for y, we do the cross product, okay? So if I say this is over one, and I do this cross product, I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about. We end up with the following. So x times two y is two x y, x times three is tx, uh, three x, and then one times four y minus. We're solving for y. So uh, if we are uh, solving for y, everything involving y comes to the same side, x to the same side. And how do you move it? It, it really doesn't matter. I can move this one that way and this one that way, or I can move it the other way around. In any event, I'm bringing the y's together and x's together. Okay. Now on the right side, I factor out the y. Okay, so I want to write the right side. So the right side is y times four minus two X. One might say you can take the two out. I'm not interested in that. I want to take the Y out, okay? Can I take the two out? Yes, and then I divide by two times two minus two X. That's okay. 
That's not what I want to do. Okay. And so look at the right side. It's Y times the parentheses. So what do you do with the parentheses? Get rid of it. How? Divide both sides by it. So I hope you see how we go from here to here. It's a very a simple process class, okay? It's a very simple process. Now, uh, you change the Y to F inverse, and you're done. Now, the only thing I want to add, what if we move it, if we go back to this step class, if we go back to this step and change the way we moved it, Things. For example, we moved 4y to the left and 3x to the right. If we did it that, I'm going to write it down here. We would get 2xy minus 4y equals minus 3x minus 1. Which means when you get to this part, the answer looks like this. Y equals minus 3x minus 1 over 2x minus 4. So I hope you realize these two are the same. The difference is this one with the asterisk has too many negative signs. That's why I wanted to avoid that. Now, I leave this for you, f or f inverse equals f inverse o f. That is, uh, that may be a little bit challenging, uh, but uh, I hope you can do that class. It's just a matter of dealing with the complex fraction. Um, I get you started on that. Okay, uh, I get you started on that. Let's see if we can um, make that happen. Let me just do this then. Okay, let's see if I can do that for you this way. It goes faster. At the very least, if you could. So, what I want to do is to first of all, let me close this. Um, This one in here also, so you see the steps. Okay, so if you want to write F or F inverse, for example, here's your step four times X minus one over two times X plus three. And so now you're going to put this in here, which is 3x plus 1 over 4 minus 2x, 3x plus 1 over 4 minus 2x. And to solve this, to simplify this, I'll give you the one more step and I leave it for you to finish it. It's very simple. It's a complex fraction. The best course of action is to multiply the top and the bottom by LCD, which is 4 minus 2x. Okay, 4 minus 2x. So when you multiply this, okay, if you look at this one and you multiply it by this, 4 minus 2x goes away and you get 4 times 3x plus 1. And then minus one times four minus two x. That is the numerator. The denominator, if you multiply this one by this one, four minus two x goes over, you get two times three x plus one, and then plus three times four minus two x. So now this is a simple case. I'm assuming everybody can finish that. I'm gonna leave it for you. To finish it, okay, 
and we take it from there. Okay, pass. It's just one simple step left. Okay. All right, so um, I practically finished that for you. Okay, so I hope everybody can do it with just one last thing. Um, so we went through this. And a for the inverse also, and so uh, the other thing about the inverse functions, as I mentioned, the uh, domain of one becomes the range of the other, and the pair. I went over this concept. The pair A B is on one, then B A is on the other. In other words, A B belongs to F A, F of X. B A belongs to F inverse. This is what I was showing you, and as a result. If we were to graph the two functions using the same set of um, axes, uh, they are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. y equals x. Very straightforward. All right, so that's as far as inverse functions. Let's look at logarithmic functions. Now, I'm assuming you remember things here. I am giving you in this page every property you need. And it comes from the fact that the meaning of a log is simply put is about exponent, okay? And as far as we recognize that practically we're done. So take a look if, um, just for the sake of argument, if I put y on this side. So take a look at this arrow, okay? That means b to the power of y. Let me just put this at top now, b to the power of y is x. So take a look at that arrow, that helps remembering. The base is very obvious, which one is the base? Log base b. Y, the result on the other hand, on the other side is the exponent. And log x base b, x the argument, is the result. So with that being the case, we get these properties. As an example, take a look. b to the power of zero is one, okay? Now it's important that you be very comfortable with those. Uh, that's the first one. The second one says if the argument, again, this is called the argument of log class X. is the argument of log. Okay. I've already discussed it, the common log in a moment. All right, so if you look at the second one here, it says when the base and the argument are the same, the answer is one. These two refer to the fact that logarithmic functions and exponential functions are inverse functions. The next one is the product rule, the next one is the quotient rule, and the next one is the power rule. In the case of a common law, we don't write the base. The base is 10. So if you see LOG and X, that means the base is 10. In the case of a natural law, we use L and X. And again, Remember, the moment you see LN, that means the base is E, okay? Now take a look at the left column in green. Now we wanna use those properties for natural laws. So see what happens. We get the following. You need to know all of this. Later on, we look at what's called a logarithmic differentiation class. You can't afford not to, okay? So I hope everybody is comfortable with the concept. All right. And of course, if you graph e to the power of x looks like uh, two to the power of x, three to the power of x, 10 to the power of x, okay? And uh, as far as the natural log is concerned on the graph, uh, please pay attention that at this point, you have one zero, and the rest of the graph depends on what you're dealing with. If 
we are dealing with zero to one. The graph is below the x-axis, okay? And that's why ln x is negative and otherwise it's above, okay? Uh, this is the change of base formula. Everybody remembers that because normally calculators can handle what? Common laws and natural laws. Uh, finally, this we will discuss this last piece when we delve into a more calculus, okay? The curve uh, y equals e to the power of x crosses the y-axis with a slope of one, okay? And the same thing happens with ln x because they are inverse functions. We, we don't have to worry about it now, but at least it's mentioned here. Okay, let's look at a couple of very simple cases discussing uh, uh, logs. I'm hoping you are all very comfortable with them. Okay, I'm hoping you remember the properties we're going to use them. So we want to evaluate this. Starting with part A, well, you notice a negative in between, so we can use the uh, quotient rule and we write it as ad over 5. So log base 2 of ad over 5, which is 16. ad over 5 is 16. And the answer is what? 2 to what number is 16? The answer is 4. 2 to what number? By the way, if it's hard to see that, you can always do this. Take a look. Right here, you can say, I don't know the answer. I'm going to say x and go with this arrow and say two to the power of x is 16. 16 is two to the power of four, therefore x becomes four. This is one way of approaching it. All right, what about part B? Very simple. Uh, ln x is five, what is x? Just write the exponential, e to the power of five, you're done. It's that simple class, okay? e to the power of 5. Okay, um, so that is that. And part C, uh, I know you have to use a calculator, but I just wanted to uh, have a question involving a uh, change of base formula. So what is log 5 base 8? You can write it as ln 5 over ln 8 or log 5 over log 8, okay? So These two ratios, we are not saying ln5 equals log5 by no means. We are saying the ratio of ln5 to ln8 is the same as log5 to log8. ln5 is a natural log, log5 is a common log. And we go with a bunch of decimals, you see the answer. It's very straightforward, okay, class? Again, I'm hoping this stuff is easy, okay? Log base 3 of 81 or log 81 base 3 or log 81 to the base 3. However you want to call it, you have to mention the base. So uh, one way is to say, okay, this is what, let's say x. That means 3 to the power of x is 81. 81 is 3 to the power of 4. And there you have it. So it becomes pretty straightforward class, okay? I hope, you know, uh, uh, you, you, of course, you come up with the answer four, okay? Uh, what about the next one? The same thing, what is that? You can use anything, X, Y, Z. So let's say this is X. Then what does that mean? Because I need more room, I'm gonna put it up here. And I'm, I'm, in fact, let me use a different color for that. It'd be a little bit. So, so what's the answer? I don't know. Let's say 25, okay, to the power of x is 5, okay? Now, 25, everybody knows is what? 5 squared. So I'm going to say 5 squared to the power of x is 5. So that means 5 to the power of 2x is 5. Okay, so what is the next step? It's very simple. Again, let me use a different color. So 5 to what power? You know this is 1, right? Set 2x equals to 1, and x becomes 1 half. 
What about this one? This is a common log. Common log that has one with a bunch of zeros. The answer is the number of zeros. If it's zero point, bunch of decimals and it ends with one, it's the number of decimals but negative. So the third one becomes negative three because we have three decimals. Okay, everybody? Three decimals. Okay. Graphing this quickly class, all right. Uh, starting with uh, LNX, everybody uh, knows how LNX, what well, we're supposed to know how it looks like, okay. So Y equals LNX, we're supposed to know it looks like that. Now, X minus two, that means shifted to the right by two units. So what does it do? It changes the uh, vertical asymptote from y axis to x equals two. Okay, and now minus one, uh, bring it down. So it's important to see the location for this intercept is now three comma negative one. Those are the shifts. So as you can see from the graph, okay. Uh, domain is from two to infinity, range is all real numbers, okay? And we can figure out uh, the uh, um, x-intercept, there is no y-intercept by the way, so we can see domain is x minus, and by the way, you could even find the domain right by solving this, uh, setting the argument larger than zero, okay? The graph indicates that, algebra indicates that. Okay, so you're done with that. What is the range? All real numbers. What is the y-intercept? We have none. What is the x-intercept? If you want to find the x-intercept, you have to set y equal to zero and solve it. So let's do that. Okay, if we set it equal to zero and solve, what happens? ln of x minus two becomes one. Okay, how do you solve this? Whenever you're dealing with a logarithmic equation, if you have a single log and a number, you just go to the definition. By definition, x minus two is e to the power of one. So e plus two. And therefore, precisely e plus two comma zero, that is the location for this x-intercept class. Okay, I hope everybody is comfortable with this. There is a lot of pre-calculus stuff here we are going over, and you really need to spend some time later on going over this when you're comfortable with the concept. All right. The next topic is inverse of trigonometric functions. The way they are, none of the trigonometric functions have an inverse because they are periodic functions and none of them passes a horizontal line test and they are not one-to-one. -one. So what do you do? You start working on it. For example, for sine x, we do the restriction. So if you take a look at the sine x, it is not a one-to-one -one function. So Mathematicians have decided to restrict it as follows, from negative power two to power two. By the way, why is that? Because first of all, they want to cover the whole range of negative one to one, and they didn't want it to be uh, a couple of, uh, you know, uh, branches that are discontinuous. So to keep the continuity, they go from negative power two to power two. Therefore, if you look at this, uh, you see the domain is this, and the range is what? Negative one to one. For what? For a sine function. And so what happens for the inverse function? The range becomes the domain of sine inverse and the domain becomes the range, okay? So we are looking at the inverse function. 
So if we write y equals sine inverse x, by definition, it means sine y equals x. So pay attention to this definition of inverse. And so remember, in the case of a sign, x is between negative power 2 and power 2. Now, this means y is between negative power 2 and power 2. So if you uh, want to reverse the process and if you want to graph the inverse function, it's very simple. You see these points? Let me just... This one has coordinates what? Negative power two, negative one, right? So you use this pair for the inverse becomes negative one comma negative power two. Zero, zero remains at zero. And this point has coordinates power two. one it's a parenthesis class okay so uh, now pi over two one becomes what one pi over two so if you were to graph this notice the y equals sine inverse or arc sine x all you have to do those three pairs and that's really good enough to give us the new graph okay and therefore, we are going to write their composite function is x. Now, understand what happens uh, for uh, this to be true, okay? For this to be true, you have to pay attention to the domain of this x. Domain of this x is this, okay? But if you are looking at this one now you want domain of this x and that's why you have negative one to one because sine inverse okay is between negative one and one okay as far as the wall coordinate is concerned so you want to pay attention to that okay all right so uh, having said that let's move on Let's start with something very simple. What is sine inverse of one half? Well, uh, I like to write it as alpha, beta, gamma, theta, x, whatever. And now I'm going to write the definition. By definition, sine theta is one half. I'm assuming it's a common arc and everybody knows the answer is 30 degrees of pi over six. Uh, I hope you remember your basic uh, common arcs. So one of them is pi over six. Sine is one half. Cosine is the square root of three over two. And the rest should come out easy because tangent is sine over cosine. Okay, square root of three over three. Cotangent is the reverse. Okay, square root of three. And the other two, secant theta. Okay. is one over cosine theta. Everybody remembers that. Cosecant theta is one over sine theta. Uh, cotangent theta is one over tan theta. So those are some basics that we know, okay? And I will give you more basics as we uh, come across it, okay? Um, Whenever I have more room, I write the rest of them. There are a few more I want to write. I write them in a moment. All right. The next question is asking, okay, what is tan of arc sine one third? There are really a couple of approaches. One of them is using the triangle. One of them is the identities. I will discuss the identities in a moment. So first you start with this part and you say arc sine one third. What is it? I don't know. Alpha, beta, gamma, theta. You choose. By definition means sine theta is one third. So now, if you go with a triangle, remember sine theta is one third. Sine theta is what? The opposite over the hypotenuse. Everybody remembers that, right? Opposite. 
So if you do that drawing accordingly, this is theta, opposite is one, hypotenuse is three. So what is the missing side? Three squared minus one is eight, square root of eight. Square root of eight is two squared of two. Therefore, you're looking for tangent theta. So what is tangent theta? Tangent theta is the opposite over the adjacent. Opposite over the adjacent. I hope everybody remembers all these basics. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to handle. Okay. You could do uh, um, by identities also. So I'm going to mention a couple of identities on the next page. So I have some room. Uh, I'll do that. In the meantime, again, you really want to go over this again to make sure you're comfortable. Same thing works out with the cosine. Cosine is not a one-to-one -one function. We do the restriction. And if you recall, uh, the graph goes something like this. Remember that? But the way they restricted is from zero to pi, again, to have a continuous function. And all you have to do, look up this point. Okay, this point, this point, those are zero, one, pi over two, zero, pi, negative one. Okay, class, so this is zero, one. This is pi negative one, and the, the middle one is pi over two, zero. So using those, reverse the process, and you have the graph. So I hope you see that the uh, domain, okay, which was the range of the cosine. Remember, the range of the cosine and sine are the same, negative one to one. It becomes the uh, range here, domain of negative one to one. And that's why we are going to write it this way. And I hope you know the inverse functions, just as I mentioned. The only difference is, in the case of a sine, we go from negative power two to power two to do the restriction. For cosine, we go from zero to pi. Now, uh, tangent follows the sine, but uh, doesn't include the endpoints. And uh, cotangent uh, follows the cosine. As far as secant and cosecant, some people have different takes on them, okay, class? Uh, but I, I like to stick with the same, that si secant goes with cosine and cosecant goes with sine. Now, the identities that you need to remember, the Pythagorean identities, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Everybody remembers that, I hope. Okay. Now, if we divide by cosine squared, both sides, we get tan squared. So sine squared over cosine squared is tan squared. Cosine squared over cosine squared is one. And uh, one over cosine squared is secant squared. So that's another Pythagorean theorem. And if you divide by uh, sine squared, you get one plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. So those are the identities. I'm assuming you remember, but it doesn't matter if you don't. I went over that. So you really need to remember them now. Okay, class, I can't emphasize this now. So those are some properties, some uh, identities that we need to have. Uh, as far as the uh, rest of the functions, as I said, tangent follows the sine, but the endpoints are not included because remember, tangent has <clears throat> vertical asymptotes. So we write it in this manner. Uh, cosecant inverse, secant inverse, cotangent inverse. It really depends on the text. They have a different take on it, uh, but uh, just stick with uh, the first four and you'll be fine. All right, so those are inverse trigonometric functions. This is the synopsis of that. You can look into it with more details if you like, okay? Now we have quite a few more examples we wanna look at, so let's start with this. 
You want to find the domain and the inverse function. Okay. Uh, to find the uh, domain, remember, this is the argument larger than zero. So two plus ln, ln x is larger than zero. That means ln x is larger than negative two. Okay. You get to x, you can rewrite this or you can even, if I put the e here, I get e to the power of ln x, which is x, and I get e to the power of negative two. Therefore, x is larger than e to the power of negative two, which means one over e squared. So the domain is one over e squared precisely. What is one over e squared? It's just a number. You can look up, you can put it into a calculator for an approximation. I'm not interested in that. And to uh, infinity, okay. Uh, what is its first? The very first thing we do, remember, I like to interchange X and Y. So as soon as we do that, we get to this. We want to solve for Y. First, let's get rid of this ln. And to get rid of that, we do the same thing here. If we put, if we raise, I mean, just go by the definition. Ln is equal to that. So e to the power of x equals to the argument. e to the power of x. Or you can even do this. e to the power of x, e to the power of ln. And so you subtract the two. You get to ln y. And you do the same thing again. So y is e to the power of the left side, if you will. Okay. So in other words, you can say e to the power of this, e to the power of that, e to the power of ln y becomes y. And as you can see, this is the F inverse and the domain for it is all real numbers, which right away tells you, this is the range for the original function. Y equals ln of two plus ln x. Now, there is a lot of logs involved here. It's important that you pay attention and you get comfortable with this class, okay? It's extremely important that you do that. Okay, let's look at more interesting questions. All right, let's start with number 41. Okay. We want to write this as a single log. Okay. So one third ln of x plus two cubed. Okay. Plus one half ln x minus ln of x squared plus three. Let me see. That would be the answer. I need more room to go over that. So I will. Um, Finish the rest, I come back to this question because I want to go to a one note and uh, see if I can show you the steps. But just for the sake of argument here, this one third goes here and it cancels out this one, this one has. So in other words, this becomes ln of x plus two. Why is that? Because that one third, which is the uh, coefficient becomes the exponent. So x plus two to the power of three to the power of one third. Then plus one half ln x. So we will have one half ln x here and minus one half here. So we distribute the one half, okay? And so we get plus ln x to the power of one half. And then this one half, Maybe I have room to the one half and two 
Okay, so we put the one half for ln x, okay, and then we put the one half for this, okay, plus. So this one half makes it x to the power of one half or square root of x. This one half and two, they cancel each other and they give us the ln of x squared plus three x plus two. Yeah, actually, we can try to have it done here. I hope everybody's following that. So what you are looking at, so this three, when we put them together, becomes the ln. The top has x plus two. Yeah, we can do it right here. x plus two. And then x to the power of one half square root of x. And the denominator has x squared plus three x plus two. Now, all you have to do, let me use a different color. Um, let's use this. All you have to do, replace this with its factor format, which is x plus two, x plus one. So x plus two and x plus two cancel each other. You get square root of x left at top, x plus one at the bottom. I hope it's clear to everybody. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, I hope. All right. Um, number 41 is really, really, really simple. ln of x plus y plus ln of x minus y minus 10. First of all, I'm going to get rid of this 10 and put it up here. I hope you see what I'm doing. Okay. Then anything with the plus sign becomes the numerator. So the answer is ln. These two have a plus sign, this one and this one. So x plus y times x minus one. And then z to the power of 10 goes down and here's your final answer. Okay. Um, 41c, I wanna uh, spend a minute on that. Hopefully everybody's following that. First and foremost, I'm gonna get rid of the square root and I'm gonna change it to one power of one half. I hope everybody can see what's happening. So one half comes in front and becomes one half log of x minus one over x plus one. In other words, this is equal to one half log of x minus one. over x plus one. And finally, separate them completely. And this is the final answer. Okay, uh, again, we're going over this pretty fast, but uh, it's really not that big of a deal, I hope. So let's move on class. We go to the next one, number 26. We wanna find the inverse. So I want you to pay attention to this one. It's gonna happen very fast and it's fairly simple. Number one, You can interchange x and y. That's the first thing. You have all the steps class here, so just pay attention to what happens. Uh, so we are interchanging x and y. Of course, f of x is y. We are interchanging x and y. We are interchanging x and y. We do the cross product. I'm hoping nobody has any problem with the cross product. So this is the cross product. Okay, so this is the cross product, fine. What is it that we are solving for? We want to solve for y. So how do we do that? Uh, we see e to the power of negative y, which means one over e to the power of y. You can write it as a fraction or just say, you know what, I'm going to multiply both sides by e to the power of y, to get rid of the e to the power of negative y. If you multiply both sides by e to the power of negative y, my, my apologies, e to the power of positive y, then it becomes x times e to the power of y, 
the next one they cancel each other equals one times e to the power of y and then the, the other ones cancel each other. So I hope you see the transition if let me use a different color here. If you multiply this equation by e to the power of y, take a look at what I wrote in red. Then you see the next line. You're going to solve for e to the power of y by bringing everything involved with that to the same side and factor it. So e to the power of y is the right side divided by the parentheses x minus 1. Okay, now we have too many negative signs. You can keep it. If you kept it as that, it's absolutely fine, class. But the reason I'm changing because there are too many negatives at the, the top and the bottom. I hope you see how we can make this transition. This is a basic, uh, you know, uh, arithmetic dealing with signs. And so what is y? From e to the power of y, how do we go to y? We make it into a natural law. Okay, class, we make it into a natural law. Okay, there's a lot on this page you need to get comfortable with. Okay, class, there's a lot on this page. All right, uh, let's look at uh, some equations. ln of x squared minus 1 is 3. It's very simple. You just change it to an exponential format. So the argument, which is x squared minus 1, is e cubed. And move the negative 1 and take a root, and you're done. It's very simple, plus minus. Part B, you have two choices, class. You can deal with it the way it is, or you can let e to the power of x be some variable of your choice, anything you want. Let me actually, uh, let me just write it a letter. Let me use a different color because I want to use a red one. It's hard to see now since, okay. Let's say uh, e to the power of x, you choose it to be y. Therefore, you have y squared minus 3y plus 2 equals 0. Or, and that, that's a simple factor, okay, which is simply uh, y minus 1, y minus 2. Or just recognize it with the e, whatever is easier for you. If you go with the y, y becomes 1, y becomes 2. That means e to the power of x is 1, e, e to the power of x is 2. x is ln 1, which is 0. And x is ln 2, which is precisely ln 2. You can, uh, if you want to write the approximation, a bunch of decimals. The only thing I want you to pay attention to is the following. Uh, both of them have answers. But for the sake of argument, uh, for the sake of argument, if you had something here like e, just in case e to the power of x plus some number, let's say plus 5, then e to the power of x becomes negative 5, which has no solutions, okay? I'm going to erase that, but I want you to see that both of them happen to have a solution. Uh, here's the next questions. <clears throat> Ln. And again, you can assume you can assume this is I don't know y, for example. And then now y is one. Okay, so y is e to the power of one. That means ln x is e to the power of one. And again, do it again. Ln x equals e. That means x is e to the power of e. I hope you see that. It may be too simple to see, honestly, but I hope you can see it. So one more time, if it, if it bothers you, ln of ln, ln x, write it as ln of y or ln of z or, or any variable of your choice except x, of course. 
So ln of y is 1, and y becomes e. Now you replace the y with ln x, okay? So if ln x is e, uh, then change that to an exponential form. Okay. Uh, we are solving for x class. We are solving for x. So for part b, we are going to do the same thing to solve for x. Here's the uh, easy way out. We divide both sides by e to the power of bx. Okay. And so the left side becomes e to the power of a minus bx, and the right side remains as a cc, some sort of a number or a constant. And we are going to change this. to uh, it's uh, from exponential to uh, logarithmic format because we want to go to x. So you can say ln of the left side is ln of the right side. ln of the left side becomes a minus b times x and ln of the right side is c. In other words, what I'm saying is you could say ln of this is ln of that, that's it. So the left side, ln and e, they cancel each other, a minus b times x, and x becomes ln c divided by a minus b. Okay. ln of 2x plus 1 is 2 minus ln x. What are we solving for? We are solving for x. Let's get everything involving x to the same side. So when we move the minus ln x, we get plus ln x. When we combine them, we get uh, ln of x, in other words, times 2x plus 1 is 2. Okay. And how do we get to the argument? The argument x times 2x plus 1 is e squared. So when you distribute, you get 2x squared plus x. Subtract the e squared minus e squared equals zero. How do you solve for x? There is no way except the quadratic formula class. Quadratic formula. x is minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, where a is 2, b is 1, and c is negative e squared. I'm assuming everybody can now come up with that minus b, that means minus b, minus one, plus minus the square root of b squared, which is one square root of one, minus four times two times negative a squared, and that's your x. There are two answers. We only accept one of them. Why is that? Well, if you go back to the original equation, this is a natural law, this is a natural law. Remember, the first one, 2x plus 1 must be larger than 0. The second one, x must be larger than 0. So if you look at the second one, which is easier to see, if you use minus 1 minus the square root of 1 plus 8e e squared, square root of uh, that over 4, that is negative. That's why. There are two answers. One of them is excluded class. One of them is excluded. I can't emphasize this enough. So you really want to see the domain of your original function. All right, we want to solve this um, inequality. So one easy way in order to get to x, uh, we can take the natural log of three sides natural log of the left side is ln1, 
in the middle gives us three x. So this is ln, this is ln, this is ln. So ln one and ln two are clear. And the, in the middle is three x minus one. And by the way, ln one is zero, okay? So we move the negative one, that means we add one, divide by three, we're done. It's that simple class, okay? All right, we are going to look at the next one. The next one, one minus two ln x is less than three, so move the one, okay. Divide by negative two, so the sign flips over. ln x is larger than negative one. So how do you get to x? You put e here and you say e to the power of ln x, which is x larger than e to the power of negative one. By the way, e to the power of negative one, of course, means one over e. It's a precise answer in calculus. We like to keep it as a precise line, precise answer, okay. We want to evaluate these two functions. Uh, what's the first one again? Let's say we don't know. We say alpha, beta, gamma, x, you choose it. And by definition, sine of alpha becomes negative one over square root of two. By the way, it's negative square root of two over two. I hope everybody remembers that. It's the same thing. You can change it if you want to minus. Square root of 2 over 2. And that's, remember, if you ignore the negative, square root of 2 over 2, alpha is pi over 4. Because of the restriction on the inverse, it goes from negative to positive. There's only one answer, and that's negative pi over 4. I hope everybody remembers the reference arc. So if you're looking for sine alpha equals negative square root of 2 over 2, first look at square root of 2 over 2, find the reference arc and then take it from it. The second one, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, you name it. By definition, cosine beta is square root of three over two. And I hope you remember it, it's very simple. It's just pi over six, okay? It's very simple, it's pi over six, okay? Um, by the way, just, you know, uh, to remind you, if you have something like Let's say uh, sine inverse of two, that doesn't work, okay? What is that? You can say, I don't know. Let me call that because I want you to see why it doesn't work. Uh, let's say it's uh, x, therefore sine x equals two, and this has no solutions, okay? Sine x is between negative one and positive one. That's why you wanna pay attention to that one. All right, we wanna show that cosine of sine inverse is square root of one minus x squared. So to do that, we start with this guy, and we say, we don't know what it is. How about, again, something like beta? By definition, sine theta becomes x. Okay. And everybody remember sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So therefore cosine is plus minus square root of one minus sine squared theta. Again, I'm reminding you of the identity. You replace it with x. And you have plus minus square root of one minus x squared. Now we choose only the positive one. Why is that? Very simple. When we look at the sign inverse, remember the restriction is between negative power two and pi over two, okay? Which means what? The first quadrant and the fourth quadrant. Cosine is positive in the first quadrant 
and in the fourth quadrant. I hope everybody remembers that. Sine is positive in the first and second quadrant. Okay. Tangent and cotangent, positive in the first and third quadrant. What about number 72? What is sine of two arc cosine x? Well, if arc cosine x is theta, okay, that means cosine theta is x. And we want sine two theta as a result. Class, we want sine two theta. I hope everybody's following that. I'm basically replacing this with what we found here. So what was the uh, um, identity? Sine two theta is two sine theta, cosine theta. And we already know sine and cosine from the previous one. So sine is the square root of one minus x squared. Cosine is x, okay? And I'm gonna reverse the order. I hope everybody can see how it becomes that, okay? Uh, it's very straightforward. Um, so we should be fine with that. Now, the only thing I wanna add here, so is, uh, the following. Let me see what color I want to use to make it easy to pen. Okay, so this comes from the fact that we did this before. So what about, so this is sine two theta. That's an identity you should know. What is cosine two theta? Cosine squared minus sine squared. Two cosine squared minus one. One minus two sine squared. Three. There are uh, a few more examples. You more than will come to look at them on your own. So this is uh, the synopsis of this section class.